Welcome to episode 11 of Ask the Grounding Experts, where our experts from ENS Grounding Solutions answer your engineering questions about the world of grounding and earthing. Today, our never to be forgotten David Stocken concludes our two part series where he's answering the sometimes mystifying question What is resistance to ground measurement? Take it away, David. So welcome back. This is going to be our part two of our series on resistance to ground measurements. Last week we talked about the traditional three-point fall of potential method and we discussed how it works and why it doesn't always work for us so well, right? Sometimes, uh, especially urban environments, uh, we really can't utilize the test. It's great on paper. It's definitely the gold standard, but not always so usable in real life. So what can we do um, when we have an urban environment ground, grounding system? We need to measure it, uh, measure the resistance to ground and check our actual electrodes and see whether or not they're corroding over time. Right? Well, the methodology we use is called a induced frequency test or a clamp-on res resistance to ground meter. These are commercially available. And what they involve is they involve two Rogowski coils and they actually, uh, one is an active coil, it will inject a known frequency, and the other one is a receiving coil to measure the return. So we have to have a loop of some kind in order to make this happen. So we have to have a return source. So traditionally, the way to think about this test is um, on the side of your home, you have a single ground rod installed into the earth. It's driven down in, you have a 10 foot rod, one connection, one rod. You clamp onto that wire and it injects a signal into that wire. It's oscillating back and forth that Rogowski coil and induces a current down into that copper wire. And that current goes both directions on that copper wire. Part of it goes up into your electrical box through the neutral to ground bond, up the neutral wire to the utility poles transformer. Right? hits that transformer which is tied to the XO which is tied to the chassis or case of the transformer which has a grounding electrode to it goes down that ground rod of the of the utility company's ground rod and then goes across the surface across the earth up the ground your ground rod and to uh, your uh, meter to give you an overall resistance to ground of your meter now what we're measuring on that meter is we're getting a resistance total of the resistance of the electrode we're testing, R1, plus the resistance of R2, which is the utility company's electrode system. Now in a solidly grounded Y system from the utility company, that neutral wire will be carried along through multiple utility company uh, connections with multiple ground rods across a vast distance. Now, granted, not every utility company uses solidly grounded Y. You'll want to know uh, what type of utility you're referencing to. But assuming you do have this, you can say that R2 is going to be very, very low because it's going to involve thousands of electrodes across a massive area. So you might as well call it zero. So what we're meeting, reading on our meter is going to be R1, our resistance total, which is going to equal R1 plus R2. If R2 is zero, we're reading the resistance to ground of that electrode in reference to the utility company. Uh, when we talked about uh, our three-point follow potential test, we talked about signal and return, right? In the case of a three-point follow potential test, Return was remote Earth, which was 10 times our sphere of influence out, and it was some sort of electrode, tent stakes, and things that we drove into the ground as a reference point, right? In the case of the clamp-on meter, our return, or our, our, our R2, our reference point for the return, the signal and return, is the utility company. And that's our fault current path anyhow. So when you use this meter and you use it in a, effectively and you understand your entire circuit, it can actually give you a more accurate overall resistance to ground because it's utilizing the actual return path from the utility company. 
Now, that doesn't, isn't always the case. Sometimes the utility company doesn't have solidly grounded Ys throughout their entire distri distribution network. Um, so then you're measuring your resistance in reference to just a small electrode, typically a small plate down at the bottom of the utility source. Um, you need to know that so that you can do the proper math and calculations when you're reading this. In other cases, particularly in, say, a substation when we measure this, we're trying to measure the resistance to ground. We're trying to clamp onto a single electrode uh, inside of a larger, massive parallel network. So let's take our substation example we've been doing over and over again, which is a 100 by 100 square grid with lots of cross conductors and ground rods distributed throughout. So assuming we can get under that ground rod and inject that current down the ground rod through the earth and then back up all of the other ground rods, what we're measuring in resistance total is R1 plus R2, which is the rest of the grounding system. So we get a, a, a resistance of that rod in reference to the rest of the grounding system it's already tied to. And we have massively overlapping spheres of influence. So we tend to get an artificially low resistance to ground for that one given electrode. But in the case of what, what our ultimate goal is in this case, isn't really resistance to ground per se. What we're trying to do is we're trying to see changes in resistance to ground over time. So let's say our math, we did the formulas, we measured four point, we calculated out that one 10 foot ground rod should measure, let's say, 25 ohms. We tie that one ground rod into a massive grid, and when we measure it with our clamp-on meter, because we're inside of a massively overlapping spheres of influence, we get something much lower. Let's say it's like 15 ohms. And we know it couldn't be because the soil wouldn't allow it to be that low. The soil would only allow a given electrode of a given length to equal a certain resistance, right? So we know it's because of an artificially overlapping spheres of influence, but we really don't care in this case. We want to write down that Today, when we installed this electrode, it was 15 ohms. And then a year from now, when we remeasure it, it should still be 15 ohms, right? We measure that year after year. And let's say after five years, all of a sudden, it jumps up. It's no longer 15 ohms. It all of a sudden increases to 50 ohms. That tells us that it's corroding. Something has happened inside of that electrode. And if one ground rod is going bad, it's probably a good bet that the rest of them are going bad as well. So if we set up a few key test wells and key locations in our substation, that we make sure that we can measure that resistance to ground properly on our clamp on with our clamp on meter, even if we're getting a artificially low resistance to ground, it's still valid information for us because it tells us whether that electrode is changing over time. And that change over time tells us whether or not our vertical electrode systems need to be replaced. Now, why is that important a substation? Our substations have two basic components, right? We have a horizontal grid, which is generally made out of pure copper, and we have a vertical component system, which is our electrodes. Right? The horizontal system balances our voltages. Our vertical ground rods or earthing rods get rid of our current. So one ground rod will get rid of more current out of its tip than a 100 foot of horizontal conductor. That's how efficient they are getting rid of current. Right? when it comes to this factor called leakage current, to leak that soil. Remember, our, our whole point of our grounding system is to get rid of currents and electricity we don't want. We want to get rid of them and get them into the Earth where there's lots of atoms for those electrons to tie, and tie orbits to. Right, So having a good earthing electrode that has a nice low resistance ground is very important for removing these objectionable currents quickly. And it's the tips of those ground rods that do a lot of the work. And they also tend to get the brunt of the work and they tend to corrode faster. They are also typically made out of steel. Some sort of, you know, sometimes it's high grade steel. Sometimes, you know, who knows what it's exactly made out of. It's got a little copper flashing on the outside to protect it from corrosion. 
but steel is going to corrode far more readily than copper will. Copper is very much should last decades and decades. A standard ground rod somewhere in the 5 to 20 year range depending on the soil and the amount of use it's being uh, put into it. So we definitely want to be able to measure that and see if those electrodes corrode over time so that we can go back and replace them should they start to corrode. And that's really the point of a, of a test well and a clamp-on resistance meter is to be able to measure the resistance to ground of a given electrode and see if it changes. Not whether it's the most accurate test method and gives you exactly what the resistance ground is. It's more important to see it because it can measure changes and that's what we want to see. The other important factor on a clamp-on meter, which you can't get from any other type of meter, is it also measures amperage. And you want to note that if you've got a lot of current on your ground system, you may want to understand why. You should have very low currents, even in high voltage substations. You should not be dealing with much more than an amp of current total on your ground system. If you start seeing 10, 20, 30 amps, you definitely have a problem. Something is dumping current on your ground system. And you definitely want to note, note that because it's a human safety problem. Right. Plus, you're putting stress on your ground system. All kinds of bad things happen. So the clamp on meter is a very excellent tool for use inside of your ground, uh, your substations and for measuring your grounding systems. It can be a great way to get um, good reference data for measuring changes in resistance to ground over time, which can indicate corrosion occurring on your grounding system. And uh, you want to uh, utilize that test effectively so that you get a, a, a good understanding of how your ground system and the quality and effectiveness of that ground system. And it's an important tool, and I highly recommend you, uh, you learn how to use it properly. It's a great uh, uh, instrument for your toolbox there. Um, this concludes our uh, second part of our resistance to ground measurements video. Um, join us uh, next week. We'll be talking about uh, two-point continuity measurements, and uh, we'll have another two-parter for that as well. See you soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for watching. If you found this episode helpful, please give us a quick like down below and subscribe to stay up to date on future educational videos we will be publishing. And feel free to post questions or comments below as well. We might even feature your questions in future videos. If you want to learn more about the amazing world of electrical engineering and grounding, be sure to check out our certified online courses at the links in the description below to kickstart your career. We'll see you next time.